Members are reminded of the long-standing uh, parliamentary practice to the effect that they should not comment on, criticise or make charges against a person outside of the Houses or an official, either by name or in such a way as to make him or her identifiable. Could I now ask you, Minister, to make your opening statement, please? Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Chairman. Good morning. And I'd like to thank the Rock the Health Committee for inviting me to attend uh, today to discuss the implementation of Sláinte Care with you. And I'm very pleased to be joined by Laura McGahey, uh, who was recently appointed as Executive Director of the Sláinte Care Programme Office. Laura was appointed following a comprehensive recruitment process and brings a wealth of experience to the role. And I want to formally welcome her to the position and assure her of my full support in this challenging uh, but exciting role. Laura took up uh, post officially on the, on the 1st of September and has very much hit the ground running since then. And shortly I'll ask Laura to outline her immediate plans for implementation and progress to date. Uh, just as the government and I value the cross-party support that produced the Sláinte Care report, we recognise that the same support and cross-party cooperation will be required to successfully deliver the Sláinte Care implementation strategy. I think every party and grouping in the Oireachtas, perhaps bar one, uh, has said they're in favour of Sláinte Care and they're in favour of the implementation of Sláinte Care, uh, which is very encouraging. I suppose we all, do all need to work together now to make that a reality. As I've said here before, we will only succeed in bringing about change if everyone, uh, politicians, clinicians, Missions, patients, service users and others are united on the overall goal and we're all pulling in the same direction. The publication of the Sláinte Care implementation strategy in August marked another important step in this process. The strategy provides an implementation framework for the transformation pro process and it outlines 106 specific actions that will be taken over the next three years, the first three years of the strategy. I firmly believe that this process is different to others that came before it because this is not my plan and it's not just the government's plan the long-term plan it is the only plan it is everyone's plan change of this magnitude cannot be delivered overnight and it's important that we acknowledge this is a strategy that will take time to implement the publication of the strategy was an important step but this is a process that will have many steps uh, over its lifetime We've also paid particular attention to getting the implementation governance and structures right, which I know was rightly important to the Committee on the Future of Healthcare. In the past, this has been lacking. We've had many strategies before. It's been a lack of an implementation structure that's often caused the challenges, and I will return to this later. Finally, uh, Chair, we are committing to the development of detailed action plans each year, and we will measure our progress transparently with twice yearly progress reports. This is a new departure in terms of health reform, um, and we're trying to use a model that's been used, say, for example, in the action plan for jobs model, where you don't just say you're going to do something, you say you're going to do it and then you report against it. So every six months we will publish a progress report to show this is what we said we were going to do, this is who we said was going to do it, is it done? If it is, great, and if it isn't, why is it not? I think that transparency um, in terms of reform is something that quite frankly has been lacking. Uh, in our health service over many years and it's, um, it's a focus I hope we can bring to it. The Sláinte Care report will be delivered over a 10-year period and at its core it will do a number of things. It will move our system to a population-based approach of healthcare planning and delivery and this will involve the development of a citizen care master plan for the health service. This will inform service planning, resource allocation, workforce planning and policy prioritisation. This is really important. In the past we've tried to develop the health service to suit the health service, the system for the system. What we're actually trying to do now is find out what services do our citizens need, what is the citizens care master plan and then put the structures around that, not the other way around. Informed by this uh, framework, new models of care will be designed that are structured, coherent and tailored to population need. It will continue the focus on promoting the health and well-being of our population through the implementation of Healthy Ireland, the framework for improved health and well-being. And a priority action is the publication of the Healthy Ireland outcome framework this year. A huge part of Sláinte Care, in fact at the very core of Sláinte Care, will be the focus of bringing the majority of care into the community. This will require a much stronger system of community care with increased resources and an expansion in the range of services that are available. The initial focus will be on developing capacity to manage chronic disease in the community, development of community intervention teams, we've made some progress on that, increasing investment in and access to community-based diagnostic facilities and the development of community nursing services. We will also move towards a health service where care is provided on the basis of need and not on the ability to pay. This ambition must be planned carefully and must be introduced over a time period that is appropriate in terms of making sure we have the workforce and the investment in place. If you don't get this right, if you get the sequencing of this wrong, all you actually do is end up rationing 
uh, care in the community rather than ensuring people can access it. Progress is being made in extending entitlement, including providing medical cards to those in receipt of domiciliary care allowance and GP visit cards to those in receipt of carers allowance. The government is also committed to the introduction of a statutory scheme for home care to support people to live in their own homes and it is my intention that this scheme will be operational within this first three-year period of the strategy that we're discussing specifically today. Under Sancho Care, we will move our system from long hospital waiting times to a timely service, especially for those who need it. There is no single solution to this, but additional bed capacity both in the hospitals and the community uh, is a big part of it, along with investing further in home care services, multi-annual plans for reducing waiting times, and considering how best to introduce a waiting time guarantee. One development that I believe will be significant, and indeed the Slaunchy Care Report talks about, is the development of elective hospitals. We have funding to deliver three elective hospitals, one in Dublin, one in Cork and one in Galway. I had the opportunity last week with Laura McGahey to visit uh, the Golden Jubilee Hospital in Glasgow in Scotland to see exactly how they developed an elective-only hospital. And, and the good news is um, they have managed to significantly reduce their waiting lists. When that hospital first opened, people were waiting three years for a hip or a knee replacement. They now have that down to 12 weeks. When the hospital first opened, people were waiting two, two and a half years for a cataract. They now have that down to an average of, of four weeks. So we now must move on with the development of our elective facilities. We've seen it's worked in Scotland. Uh, we now need to produce that model here as well. We're going to pick the sites uh, for these three hospitals next year. And our focus is always on driving down waiting lists and ensuring patients can have access to services as soon as possible. Sloncha Care will also bring about improved governance, performance and accountability, something this committee spends a lot of time talking about uh, for very good reason and scrutinising. This will be achieved through the establishment of a HSE board, defining new organisational and operational structures for the future reconfiguration of the health services. The HSE board legislation will be introduced in the Shannon uh, next week on the 10th of October, and I hope with everyone's cooperation here to pass it through both houses of the Oireachtas this year so that it can take office at the beginning of next year. I was pleased to announce Kieran Devan as chair designate of the new HSC board. Mr Devan brings a wealth of experience to what would be a very challenging role. I look forward to him having an opportunity to come before your committee, uh, Chairman, uh, to be scrutinised on his views and plans in relation um, to that role. I've already mentioned the importance of implementation, governance and structures, and I would like to briefly outline a number of key elements. There's widespread agreement that significant change and reform requires a well-resourced programme office to champion, lead and manage the process. The Sláinte Care report recommended the establishment of such an office, and a Sláinte Care programme office has now been established. It will be led by Laura, and it is being resourced with the skills and expertise necessary to lead the reform programme. The Programme Office is, as I said in August, working on a detailed action plan which will be published before the end of the year. This will include a review of all the actions on the associated timeframes, the development of detailed milestones and, crucially, the assignment of responsibility for each action. In the Sláinte Care report produced by the committee, it did ask that when we publish the plan, that that plan would then be reviewed by the Executive Director. And that's the process that we're now undertaking and published uh, by the end of the year. There are two other structures which I wish to draw your attention to briefly this morning, Chairman. The first is the Sláinte Care Advisory Council. I think it's really important that we get stakeholders involved and that we ask experts here to help us out in the delivery of this plan, because this plan can't be something just owned in the Oireachtas or in the HSE. So I'm very eager that an advisory council would be in place. I'm delighted that it will be chaired uh, by Dr Tom Keane, a very eminent clinician and clinical leader who came to our country and worked with my predecessors and previous governments to reform our cancer services, and we're seeing the benefit of those outcomes today. I'm delighted that Tom has agreed to lend his services to Ireland again. Uh, and Tom will chair the Advisory Council. It will comprise of 23 members. And this morning I was pleased to be in a position to announce the membership of the Council. And for the record of the committee, that w the, the membership is Professor Tom Keane, uh, the, ch the former director of the National Cancer Control Programme, Laura McGahey, the executive director, Siobhan Kennelly, a consultant geriatrician, Anthony O'Connor, a consultant gastroenterologist, Paddy Bro, a general surgeon in Bowman and clinical director of the RCSI group, Colm Henry, the Chief Clinical Officer of the HSE, Annette Kennedy, the President of the International Council of Nurses, Dr Ronan Fawcett, a uh, GP in Kilkenny who's really done some excellent work in terms of uh, the development of primary care, Gillian O'Brien, the Director of Clinical Governance in Jigsaw, Roisin Malloy, um, an incredible patient advocate with a wealth of experience in this area, Brendan Courtney, a patient advocate who really shone a spotlight on the importance of getting home care right in this country and looking after our older citizens, Sarah O'Connor, the CEO of the Asthma Society, uh, Brian Fitzgerald, a former CEO of St James's Hospital, Deputy CEO of Beak the Beacon, Liam Doran, the former General Secretary of the INMO, Leo Kearns, the CEO of the RCPI, 
Joseph Figueres, who I believe would have spoken at the Committee on the Future of Healthcare and is a director of the European Observatory. Joanne Shear, the former National Primary Care Clinical Program Manager of the US Veterans Health Administration. Heather Shearer, the a clinical governance expert. Eddie Malloy, a management consultant. Paul Reed, the CEO of Fingal County Council, um, who I think brings a wealth of experience in change management. Um, Professor Mary Higgins, an obstetrician in the National Maternity Hospital. Dr. Anna McHugh, a GP registrar in Donegal. And Dr. Emily O'Connor, the president of the Irish Association of Emergency uh, Management and a consultant in emergency medicine uh, at Connolly Hospital. So you have 23 members of the committee, almost gender balanced, uh, a split of 12 and 12 to 11, um, and, a, and a wide range um, of skill sets there, both from a patient advocacy point of view, from a change management point of view, uh, and also from a... Um, from from a medical point of view, which is so which is so important as well. So I really want to thank those people uh, for stepping up and sort of serving, offering us their wealth of experience. The first meeting of the advisory council will take place and be chaired uh, by Dr. Keane on the twenty fourth um, of October. And I hope this committee will at some point have an opportunity to engage. Uh, with Professor Keane uh, on his role and how he envisages the Advisory Council helping us uh, deliver. The second structure, and I'll pick up my speech here, Chairman, is the High Level Delivery Board. This will be made up of the Secretaries General of the Department of the Taoiseach, the Department of Public Expenditure Reform and the Department of Health, the Director General of the HSE and the Solange Care Executive Director. This is really important. Um, the Committee on the Future of Healthcare said to me, said to everybody, that you wanted a whole of government approach to this. And I think having a high level delivery board um, that the executive director uh, can feed into and that can then feed into the Cabinet Committee on Health chaired by the Taoiseach is absolutely crucial. And having in the room the Secretary General of the Department of Taoiseach, the Department of Health, and the Department of Public Expenditure and Reform, I think is really important. And it's very much in line with the Committee's strong recommendation on the need for cross party, uh, sorry, cross government uh, support. So we have begun progressing a number of recommendations already. As I've said, we moved ahead with the establishment of the HSE board. We'll have that legislation commencing in the Shannon next week. As I say, I'd really appreciate cooperation in relation to that. Crucially, we've carried out a public consultation on the geo-alignment of hospital groups and community health organisations. This is now being completed. I'll publish the results shortly. And let me say this, I want to move ahead with outlining what geo-alignment will look like this year. And I'll need your support on this. Drawing, ma drawing lines on maps, um, is never the easiest thing for any politician to do. Uh, the Solange Care Committee uh, very helpfully left it to my department to work out how best to divide up the country. But what the Solange Care Committee was very, very keen on, and what I'm very, very keen on, is that we move away from this siloed approach that you have duplicate management structures um, for the community care and the hospital care. If we are to deliver Solange Care, we need geo-alignment. We need a singular budget for a certain geographic part of the country to deliver the whole spectrum of care. That's what we need to get to. Um, I've taken the decision in consultation with Laura Magahi to move forward on that at a quicker pace uh, than originally envisaged. And I intend to uh, announce um, my proposed geo-alignment uh, this year. I think this is the potential game changer that you want to see in terms of Solange Care because you can no longer have siloed budgets. Somebody saying, oh, patient X needs to remain in the hospital because it will cost me money to care for them in the community or vice versa. One budget with a board for each regional entity uh, holding people to account at a regional level, um, I think is really a very important way. It will help deliver integrated care, but I will need your support. Uh, if we are to legislate for this, I, I will need the support, the cross-party support, uh, in terms of delivering that. And I'd be very happy, Chairman, to discuss with this committee the public consultation document in advance of that, or indeed to send that to this committee so you could consider it, and I'd very much welcome, um, in the spirit of bipartisanship, uh, your commitment, uh, your consultation, rather. The Committee on the Future of Healthcare also was very clear in relation to the role of private practice in public hospitals. And let me be clear, because sometimes I hear myself described by my opponents uh, wrongly in relation to this. I am in favour of the removal of private practice from public hospitals. But, like the Solange Care Committee, I'm in favour of doing it in an intelligent, phased way. Uh, I've made my views on this very clear. I believe our current mixed model system is an outlier. We cannot convince ourselves it is the norm. It is not the norm. It is an outlier in that in a public hospital, you can have a public hospital full to capacity and a patient who is in greater need of care not getting that care because somebody um, is carrying out private practice in that hospital. We can't stand over that. But we also have to do it right. 
um, and we can't do it overnight. So the committee asked me to set up an independent review group. I've done that. It's being chaired by Dr. Donald Butler uh, to examine the impact of separating private practice from the public hospital system. The work is ongoing. I expect to receive that report by the end of this year or, or shortly thereafter. And this will then provide valuable guidance, which I'd welcome a chance to discuss with this committee. But my policy objective is clear. I believe we need to remove private practice from public hospitals, but we need to do it in a way uh, that makes, uh, makes sense. I want to just briefly talk about the role general practice needs to, to play in relation to this. We cannot deliver a decisive shift um, to primary care or community care or more services if we don't resource general practice. You'll be pleased to know that I have reached agreement with the Minister for Public Expenditure and Reform uh, on very significant multi-annual funding for general practice and I expect very intensive engagement to commence uh, on this matter in the next few short uh, weeks. Finally, I've already mentioned capacity. We know that the Irish Health Service, even when you make reforms, it doesn't have adequate bed capacity. We are, again, we do not compare favourably internationally in relation to this. We do have in our national development plan 10.9 billion euro, um, much of which is directed very much at Slaunch Care. This will include 2,600 extra beds, the three elective hospitals I mentioned, and 4,500 community care beds that have already been identified. It will also include the rollout of e-health, so important and a key recommendation of Slaunch Care, and putting diagnostics into our primary care centres. We have 124 primary care centres across the country now in operation. The key now is what more can they do? Um, can we put more x-ray facilities, more ultrasound facilities, um, more staff into these facilities? And I'm pleased that the development plan will deliver that. So I am confident, Chairman, that the plan that many of you in this room worked so hard on uh, and engaged on for such um, a long period of time is, is the right plan, and that if we implement it, we'll very much be on the right track. We've agreed on the vision. We now have an implementation strategy. We now have dedicated people led by Laura to actually deliver and implement this strategy. We will report twice a year. We will publish detailed annual action plans uh, and we will resource this um, through the budgetary process as well. This is going to require a broad coalition of support and I do look forward to working with all stakeholders on the important agenda. And with your permission, Chairman, I might ask Ms McGahey to say a few words. Yeah, Ms McGahey, you can make your opening remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman, and thank you, members, and I very much look forward to working with all of you over the next number of years to deliver on the Slaunch Care objectives and, indeed, on the principles that were outlined in the original Rathis report. Uh, the robustness of the Slaunch Care structure, I believe, really gives a very sound underpinning, and I suppose I'm the little circle in the middle, um, so the implementation office is in the middle and will be supported by um, the advice from the Advisory Council, which I very much welcome, reporting through to the other uh, structures that the, the Minister has outlined. But I do believe it gives a, a, a strong link um, back through to the system and down and out to the people who are actually delivering the services. Um, the remit of the programme office is to establish the programme of reform, to develop a strategic and programmatic approach to implementation, working with all parts of the system to ensure that everybody is following the strategy and to work collaboratively with all the stakeholders and to support the work of colleagues in the reform efforts and indeed to report on progress. And I'm very keen that I'm not going to duplicate any effort that is around. So what I'm proposing is to have a small, tight office that then links out to the people who are doing the work and to have a very strong focus on implementation. Um, I'm mindful that everybody uh, here has a part to play in this launch care um, delivery and I suppose key to that is the continuing political buy-in in, in particular and uh, the leadership that was shown uh, by the cross party around this committee and, and that's so important to me um, in the implementation process and I do look forward to working with you to uh, hopefully continue to have your support. And I'm very happy to meet with you individually if you'd like to have more details on what I'm proposing um, and, and to really encourage that involvement from, from yourselves um, in, in the process. Um, key, I do believe, though, also is citizen engagement and empowerment. Um, and I'm beginning a programme of citizen engagement and empowerment before the end of this year um, because, again, the buy-in of the citizens is, is critical to, to this process, as indeed is the frontline enablement so the people delivering the services uh, and also the wider determinants determinants because we do tend to focus in health I think on the HSE and on on those structures but actually the wider determinants and involving them in the prevention in particular uh, for the health and well-being of people is something that I'm going to be focusing on so very much a partnership approach um, 
I beg your pardon. I was just going to say just a couple of uh, points that I've done. I'm, I'm 23 days in office, uh, so just very new, really. Um, so obviously, it's a long time. <laughs> long time in politics. <laughs> it's not a long Good time in implanting. Yeah. Not a long time in implanting a 10-year strategy. <laughs> um, so the the office it was established, uh, and I'm very much engaged in beginning discussions with people and what's important to them um, and identifying those priorities. But, but key in my job really is to um, come back before uh, the end of December with a, an action plan for 2019 that says who's doing what, where, when and how. So that is my focus and there are 106 actions in this strategy so I'm, I'm intent on, on delivering when I said I would do it. Um, the Advisory Council is established in our first meetings in October. And I've, I've finalised uh, my approach to the Citizen Care Master Plan. And as I said, the Citizen Engagement and Empowerment process will roll out before the end of the year. And obviously, the budget is, is under discussion at the moment. So thank you very much for the opportunity to meet you all and uh, look forward to working with you. Thank you very much, Ms McGahey. So, uh, Minister, the, the process we're going to engage in this morning is we're going to give each member seven minutes to uh, interact across the floor. So we'd like the members to be concise in their questions and perhaps... You to, you to be concise in your answers so that we can move along speedily. So, Minister, I'd just like to ask you a number of questions to start off with. Um, yep. The first one is, why, why was the Sloan to Care Office not set up in the Department of the Taoiseach rather sure. than in the Department of Health, as recommended in the Sloan to Care report? Sure. Uh, secondly, given the na nature of uh, building in, in, in Ireland and the nature of building hospital beds, when do you expect the first new hospital bed will be built and available because I understand that most of the capital resources at the moment are going into the completion of the Children's Hospital, which won't be completed until 2021 or 22. And the third question, Minister, is why in the strategic uh, uh, Sloan Care st st implementation strategy was there no reference made whatsoever to uh, setting up of an, a national health fund, which was a central component of the Sloan to Care recommendation on how this would be funded going into the future. Thank you. Well, thanks very much, uh, Chairman. So the Department of Health versus the Department of the Taoiseach in terms of where the office should reside is something we discussed at this, at this committee in the past, and it's something that I made my views very clear on. The Minister for Health, and indeed under Sloan to Care, the Minister for Health is accountable to the Oireachtas for the delivery of the health service, um, you know, subject to the health acts and the powers of the HSE and the functions that they have, um, and is also accountable democratically um, in terms of answering parliamentary questions, topical debates, private members' motions, legislation, and to hive off the responsibility for reform of the health service, not to the Minister for Health of the day, um, would have been a very peculiar construct in my view and the view of government under the Ministers and Secretaries Act um, as well. So what we did do though, and, and I did flag this with the Sancho Care Committee in advance of publication, I did, I did also flag it at this committee post-publication, and what we did do was though make sure um, that there was a structure in place to try and achieve the same objective, whether you agree or disagree, we have done that. That's what we endeavoured to do. So by ensuring that there's a high-level delivery board that involves the three sec gens of the three, kind of, if we call them the crucial departments, the Department of the Taoiseach, representing the Taoiseach of the day, the Department of Health, representing myself, and the Department of Public Expenditure and Reform in terms of resourcing, um, I think is, 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 is the way to go. Also, the fact that the Taoiseach will chair the Cabinet Committee on Health, where if you look at the governance structure, um, the Sloan Care Office uh, will report into, and, and Laura and indeed myself uh, will account to the Taoiseach uh, for. In relation to the beds, it's a very valid question that you ask. Uh, how quickly can we start delivering hospital beds? And I can assure more hospital beds. And I can assure you, it's a question that I ask several times a week as well. I've asked the HSE to do a body of work to produce um, to produce a document. How many beds could they deliver over the next three years? using a combination of modular build, uh, existing space in hospitals, and a degree of internal reconfiguration to make more space or to make space better used in hospitals. And they've come back with a figure of in around 600 hospital beds over the next three years. I can send you a detailed note, Chair, because I don't have it to hand, but the answer to your question is, I believe over the next three years, about 600 of the 2,600 beds can be delivered. Um, it's a fair, a fair chunk of them towards the latter half of 2019. An area you'll be familiar with geographically um, and, and medically is obviously Limerick. So if you take the example of what do I mean in that region, um, and indeed Deputy Kelly very familiar with this too, I mean the, I mean the delivery of the modular bills that would put 60 beds 
uh, into into University Hospital Limerick, which is something I'm very committed to doing, and I've discussed with the hospital group CEO. So that that modular build in Limerick, sixty beds, is an example of the first tranche, if you like, in that six hundred. Um, in relation to the national fund, um, it was decided um, when we were publishing the implementation plan not to make any decisions that are budgetary matters uh, outside of the normal budgetary cycle. Um, but we will need um, we will need for the delivery of Sláinte Care an integration fund. I believe there's already an awful lot of funding in the Department of Health both now and that's likely to come through the budgetary process that will be Sláinte Care proofed. So if you look at the capital plan, there's almost 11 billion in the capital plan. My own analysis of the plan suggests that about 6.6 .6 billion of that is Sláinte Care. Um, be it elective only, be it diagnostics in the community, be it bed capacity in the hospitals in the community and e-health. But above and beyond that, what I need to empower, if that's the right word, Laura and her team to do and the Sláinte Care Advisory Council to assist with is the, the large scale rollout of projects to take services from the acute into the community. And without preempting that strategy, just to give you an example of one of the kind of models that people often talk about is the Sligo Eye Care model. That has been piloted now for so long, everybody accepts that it works. At what point can we actually say, let's do that? If I can take another example in Deputy Kelly's constituency of the Nina Cataract Theatre, another example of how we know it works. But if it works in Nina, can we make it national? Um, if you take the CIT, the community intervention teams, we know they work. We are rolling them out. Can you roll it nationally? Sorry, so, sorry. Just, sorry to interrupt you, Minister, sure, and just no. to keep, keep it moving. Please, yeah. Um, the Santa Care uh, recommended that there would be funding uh, allocated to the plan on a yearly basis of 385 to 450 in relation to the expansion of entitlements and a 3 million transition fund to make up for the lack of infrastructure over the no last number of years. But in, the, in, in your implementation strategy, there's no reference to funding whatsoever. You, you, you make a, a reference to an integration fund. Yeah. There's no value put on that fund. Correct. So how can you give us confidence that there is going to be funding made available to implement this strategy? And I, I just one minute, and then oh, I'm sorry, going to move so, to so I, Deputy I, I, Donnelly. I, so I'll give you a very straightforward answer. So it, it is, it is, that's an issue that will have to be addressed as part of the normal budgetary process. And when I launched the implementation plan in August, I would have made that point. Um, that the government has decided that the resourcing is launch occur, which is something all political parties obviously have a role to play in a, in a minority government's life. Um, in terms of the resourcing of that plan, it is a matter for the estimates process. Obviously, we have our, we have our budget next week. Thank you very much, Minister. Now, Deputy Donnelly. Thank, thank you. you, Chair. Uh, you're very welcome, Minister. And uh, Ms McGahey, uh, I'd like to wish you the very best of luck. You've taken on a Herculean task. Uh, Fianna Fáil has signed up to launch um, care. We, we helped write it, and we would like to see it. Um, implemented. Uh, Minister, uh, healthcare reform is, is, is difficult, it's complex, it fails a lot of the time around the world. And one of the things it requires is credibility of leadership. Um, and I, I, I am worried by some of your, your statement in that uh, you are understandably looking to the future, but there is no reflection on the problems we have right now. So, uh, since 2011, healthcare spending has gone up every year, total healthcare spending. It's gone up per person, and it's gone up when you adjust uh, for inflation. And yet, uh, waiting times across the board for men, women, and children the, uh, uh, all over Ireland are worse than they've ever been. Um, we have the third year in a row with a massive budgetary overrun and it's fair to say that clinicians all over the country um, are at their wits' end. And I just want to focus on waiting times because it's the one that affects uh, the patients most. Children with special needs are waiting three and a half years for treatment. Young children with scoliosis are waiting three years for treatment. Uh, in the rest of Europe, spinal curvature isn't allowed to get past 45 degrees. In Ireland, it's past 100 degrees. Um, there's now, for the first time ever, over a million uh, people or, or, or lists. The, the waiting lists have gone over a million. When you add the NTPF figures with all of the other figures, we're at a million. We've never seen this happen before. Um, and in spite of annual increases in funding, it's getting worse and worse. So in, in, if we take the number of people waiting for surgery over a year, in 2010, it was about 700. It was just over 700. Uh, and now it's 14,000. So for every one person in Ireland who was waiting over a year for surgery in 2010, for every one of them, there's now 20. 
which goes to the heart of credibility. And my real fear is that these failures and the responsibility to fix these things are now being put on Sláinte Care. Uh, the presentation lists seven Sláinte Care objectives. I won't read through them all, but I would put it to you that four of these objectives should have nothing to do with Sláinte Care. They're just the job of government. Promote the health of our population. That's just normal health care. Um, move our system from long waiting times to a timely service. That's nothing to do with Sláinte Care. That's just the job of this government. Waiting times uh, were falling drastically and were... were 20 times lower uh, in 2010 than they are now uh, in certain areas. Accountability and performance is just the normal job of healthcare management. Um, and so I'm, I'm concerned uh, that there is a lack of acknowledgement of just how bad things have got in healthcare, both for patients and clinicians. And I'm also concerned that Sláinte Care has been given the role not just of system reconfiguration, which is its role in moving to a, to a more modern model of care, but also that it is being tasked with uh, fixing the problems that it is just the normal job of government to fix, like waiting times and not having massive budgetary overruns every year. So can I ask you, in the spirit of trying to get this right, do you accept the failures uh, within the healthcare system today? particularly in terms of the waiting lists, which are longer than they've ever been since, since records were taken. Um, do you agree that in order to implement a very serious and ambition, ambitious program of change, that we're going to see, we're going to need much more competence in delivery from government based on what we're seeing patients are facing every day? And can you tell us how you plan to bring that competence, given that what we are facing and what we're all signed up to is a, is a complex uh, and, and difficult and important programme of change. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy. So, uh, Deputy Donnelly, it's taken four minutes there, Minister, so I don't know if you can answer him in three, but... I'll do my very best. Uh, I mean, the, the first thing, thank you, Deputy Donnelly. Uh, well, certainly when I look to reform, I'm definitely going to look to the future because I'm not going to look to the past because the way people have endeavoured to reform the health service in this country has created many of the current problems. So the idea of setting up a national entity, which, by the way, I think most political parties agreed with, uh, was botched. And as a result of it being botched, we have layers of bureaucracy that make it impossible often for our citizens to find answers. So I welcome the fact that we have a cross-party approach in terms of how we should reform the health service that is very much better than the reforms that have gone before it. Um, you listed a number of things that you, you say, and I get the point you're making and I'll, and I'll answer it, but you, you said they're nothing to do with Sláinte Care. They're very much in it, obviously, which you very much, very much know. So, I mean, Sláinte Care talks very extensively about the things that I said in relation to waiting lists and calls on me to do them. And I suppose what I'm doing is accounting to this committee today for my intention to do them. I don't accept that everything in healthcare has gotten worse um, because it depends on what you measure. So, for starters, let's talk about waiting lists. There are figures now published in relation to waiting lists that were never published uh, before this government was in office. Outpatient figures were never published before 2014. Um, they were never published. So people talk about you know, figures now. You're, 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 you're not comparing like with like. There are challenges in relation to waiting lists, absolutely. But the number of inpatient day cases, as, as, as something that your party and mine agreed in confidence and supply, the number of inpatient day cases, uh, people on waiting lists is actually falling. 13,000 fewer patients on those lists. Outpatients is a major challenge. I think one of the main ways the way we address it, though, is through this laundry care model. Uh, whereby we actually try to see who can be seen locally in the primary care centre through the GP, through an advanced nurse practitioner. But many of the metrics have gotten an awful lot better. Um, and I think to, I'm not suggesting you do this, but to, to, blame, to blame the government for all the failures and credit everyone other than uh, government policy and investment on anything that's good in the health service doesn't stand up to much scrutiny. So if you look at kids with cystic fibrosis in this country, thank God, will now live an awful lot longer than they would have. That's as a result of great clinicians, but significant investment we've made in drugs like where can be. Um, if you look at uh, outcomes for cancer, if you look at outcomes for stroke, if you look at outcomes for heart conditions, if you look at life expectancy, if you look at trolley numbers, any person on a trolley is too high, but the trolley gar for the HSE fell by 5% in September. So there's a huge body of work to do, and there are very, very many challenges, and I accept there are very, very many challenges in healthcare. Absolutely, I accept that. But I don't accept that everything in healthcare 
uh, is in crisis because every single day many people have a positive experience. When we actually surveyed our patients who went into the hospitals last year and actually said to them, how did you find your experience from the moment you walked into the ED to the moment you were discharged from the hospital and you had to have stayed at least one night in an acute adult hospital, 86% of people said it was good or very good. I need to be very worried every moment of every day about the 14% who didn't have that good experience. And if we're to address that, we need to implement uh, we need to implement Sláinte Care. I do think this plan has credibility. I think the real reason it has credibility um, is because it has something that we've never had before in healthcare. Um, it has all of us supporting it. But more importantly than just all of us supporting it, and political support is definitely important for this, um, it, it, has, it, has, it has a decent chance of being given the length of time it's going to need to actually function. Because when I became Minister for Health, and if you're ever Minister for Health in the future, I mean, the first what people in the health service despair about is another new minister with a bright shiny plan we now have one plan that we're all pulling in the direction on it is going to require resources in terms of answering your question i suppose about the delivery of it and accountability for the delivery of it i am the minister for health i'm accountable for delivering this laura mcgahey is charged over the office i'm accountable to the Oireachtas for the delivery of this plan and if we publish an action plan at the end of this year and say we're going to do this that, and the other and report against that every six months i'm accountable uh, to you and to the people of Ireland for Thanks, Mr. Uh, on that then, and I'll finish on this, Chair, thank you. Um, I, the short version is this. There are, uh, my concern is that Sloan Care is going to be tasked with solving things like waiting lists. We don't need Sloan Care to bring down waiting lists. We don't need Sloan Care to promote the health of our population. Uh, we don't need Sloan Care to drive accountability and performance. Uh, and we don't need Sláinte Care to deliver a healthcare system uh, that has the ability to plan and execute. We need Sláinte Care for reconfiguration. Um, so I just want to make that point that bringing these waiting lists down and helping these men, women and children has nothing to do with Sláinte Care. Most of these things have got worse over the last, no uh, last number of years. My final question then is on cash. Can you, can, you, can you tell the committee over the next, say, one to five years, how much money you're seeking for Sláinte Care, explicitly for Sláinte Care activities, as opposed to the normal increases in health care expend expenditure we would expect to see. Thank you. In one minute, Minister. In one minute. So, so we're not going to have time to have the debate back and forth. I don't agree that Sláinte Care isn't the key to addressing a lot of these challenges, including waiting lists, because I think delivering what Sláinte Care calls on me to deliver is key, but, but, I, but I take the point you're making. Um, I can't, I can't give you an answer a week out from the budget in terms of how much money I'm seeking in the budget, or perhaps your own party indeed are seeking uh, in the budget in relation to the delivery of Sláinte Care. I'll give you one example that I can give you in terms of multi-annual. In the almost 11 billion euro that we have for capital, uh, 6.6 .6 billion of that is what I would describe as Sláinte Care funding in terms of the delivery of the capital elements of it. In terms of the delivery of the current elements of it, um, that will be a matter for obviously budget day next week and then the HSE service plan. I'm happy to come back and interact on it. Thanks, Chair. Thank you very much, Minister. And now, Deputy Louise O'Reilly. Thank you, Chair. Um, and good morning, Minister. And good morning, good morning. Uh, Ms. McGuy. You're very welcome, and I, I do wish you the very best of luck um, with the task ahead. There's an awful lot riding on it uh, as it goes. Um, and, and I was listening to the exchange there that I could play the game of which one of uh, the previous governments um, had made the biggest mistakes in the health service. We could play that all day, but it probably won't advance as much. Mm -hmm. But when we are looking at you know, what has been measured and, and what can... The INMO have been measuring trolley weights for a long time and uh, they don't always concur with the HSE trolley guard figures and, indeed, I think they do show a picture that is getting worse. Um, with regard to the overspend and uh, the, the carryover of recurring expenses. Can you confirm that that's going to be addressed in the budget? Um, because talking about investment, I mean, months after the last budget, you got a letter from the head of the HSE to say that the, uh, that the HSE was in trouble and that was, uh, that was a result of underfunding. Um, Pierre Starty did point it out to you, but you didn't listen. Maybe you listened this year and hopefully you did, but you might confirm that. Sure. Um, with regard to the transition of services uh, to primary care, much of our primary care is centred around GPs. Uh, there is no evidence that I have seen that there uh, is any progress being made on the renegotiation of the GP contract. Uh, can you give us an up-to-date as to where um, that is at? 
Uh, I have asked repeated uh, questions with regard to the staffing for our primary care centres. I get the same answer every single time. Uh, it's a real cut and paste job. Services will be provided from within existing resources. I can even quote it. So there's no new staff. Um, so if you have a vision for how this is going to work without staff, I'd love to hear it. Um, I doubt if you do. So then we need to hear about where the staff are going to come from and specifically what you're going to do with regard to GPs. The um, Slauncha Care provides for uh, that there will be legislation for entitlement for all residents um, uh, to access health and social care and a guarantee on waiting lists underpinned by legislation. The uh, implementation plan has changed that slightly and it uses the words uh, expand eligibility on a phased basis and move towards universal health care. If it's universal, then we don't have to discuss eligibility, and there, there does seem to be some contradiction. And there also has been, uh, uh, I think, some slippage with regard to a the universality, but also the uh, the legislation to underpin guaranteed waiting times. Uh, and I would echo the previous comments. It is very much uh, bound up with the, uh, with the with the waiting list because. It's a mechanism by which, but, but the waiting lists have got to be addressed separate to this as well. Um, the costings that the Department of Health will be using with regard to the implementation strategy, are they going to be published along with the implementation report? Uh, because I think it's important that, uh, that we would see that and we would see real progress. I don't think anyone wants this just to be a tick box, a tick box exercise. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Deputy O'Reilly. Uh, Minister? Okay, thank you very much. And I might ask Laura to come in just on, on one piece about the kind of workforce planning piece in a, in a moment to just to take go through your issues. Um, in relation to the overspend, uh, as my colleague, the Minister for Finance and Public Expenditure said, I think at a Budget Oversight Committee um, last week, um, we are uh, actively engaging himself and myself in terms of addressing what will be a requirement for supplementary funding for the health service this year. And I'm very confident that we can reach agreement on that. Um, and that issue will obviously crystallise and I expect uh, to be resolved um, in the next few days. Um, in relation to the issue, it's a broader, I, I, in relation to the issue of underspend versus value for money, I think I'd need to come back and have a separate session because I'd nearly used the seven minutes on that. But I mean, there is, there is a need for obviously accountability in terms of resources that are given. And there's also a need to obviously make sure we have an adequate budget each and every year um, within the resources available. Um, in relation to GPs, as I said in my opening statement, I have in recent days reached an agreement with the Minister for Public Expenditure and Reform um, that gives me a mandate uh, to engage with GPs on a multi-annual investment programme, um, a very substantial uh, programme. Obviously, uh, both as a subject of negotiations and obviously there's a budget, mm -hmm. so I can't be more specific than that, but I do genuinely expect very intensive engagement in the coming weeks with GPs, and I expect to be in a position to be able to significantly increase the investment in general practice um, starting next year, subject to agreement. Um, in relation to staffing for primary care centres, let, let's, in fairness to the deputy, the deputy raises this with me on a, on a very regular basis. So if we can try and get the deputy some specific um, information in relation to this. When I open primary care centres, I'm regularly told about the additional staff working here and the additional specialties being done and here, there and everywhere. So let me try and get you a notion. I'm happy to come back and debate mm. that with you, but we will. Yeah, well, and you that. might even just inform the, the officials in your Please. department because I, I could literally paper the, the walls of this room with the responses I've got, and they all say the same thing. They all say so. There, there may be new staff moving in from other areas. Say in, in Balbriggan, they close down the health centre and they move them into the new health centre. But that's no additional staff for a town with the fastest growing population in the state. You're just shifting yeah. staff around. There's no new services can be developed sure. just because you put someone, uh, you take sure. them out of a building that's derelict and put them into a building. No, that's I take that point. Shiny. No, I take that point. But just to just to I mean point out, there were extra occupational therapy posts this year. There were extra speech and language therapy posts in recent recent times and um, there have obviously been the 140 something assistant psychology posts but but I take the point and perhaps I could ask Laura to do some work in relation to that. Laura might just outline and I'll come back on the other points just the position of how we're going to plan for the workforce mm -hmm. for the delivery of Slauncher Care. Thanks, Minister. Thank you, Deputy. I think you raise a very interesting question which is about what's the new model of care going to look like when we move care that shouldn't be in hospitals more into the community um, and I suppose it's around the needs of the population and that's what the geo alignment will facilitate mm -hmm. um, and I think the point is that it's going to need a combination approach based on whatever the needs are so uh, we're going to be looking at 
talking to the different uh, training bodies about training extra GPs and practice nurses, for example, training ANPs and community nurses, cross training for disciplines, for, for multidisciplinary team approaches, um, and trying to get that in at the colleges at an early stage rather than everybody being trained in their own piece and then expected to work in a multidisciplinary um, way later by miracle. Um, I think also clinical managerial training and then also the issue of starting to engage younger professionals and enlisting their views because of the um, disaffection that many of them have expressed in working in the system. Mm. So trying to hear what they've got to say. Um, but it will have to follow the model of care. Uh, what is that going to look like when we start moving uh, pieces of work that are happening in hospitals into the community? Okay. I asked a very specific question about where the legislation has disappeared from the, it's in this launch care report, but it's not in the implementation plan, legislation to underpin waiting and the worrying yeah. move from universal access no, sorry, to expanding sorry, eligibility, sorry, if you could. Yeah, yeah, thank yeah, you. No, sorry. So sorry. I'm just conscious of time no, as well, fine. I don't want to anyway, be in into other so people's look, I, time. I actually, too. something myself and Laura have discussed in recent days, I actually agree with you on the, the word entitlement versus eligibility, and we're going to revert to using the word entitlement. The idea is that every citizen in this country should be entitled to access care in their community. This launch, so that's the first piece. We want universal entitlement, universal access to primary care. The second piece, though, and it's an important piece, and it's outlined in actions in section 6.2 of the 106 actions we published. Solange Care does say it should be low cost or no cost. That's a that's a direct phrase in Solange mm -hmm. Care. Might be no cost or low cost, but Solange Care specifically refers to that. So you will see in action 6.2, 1, 2, and 3 three very specific actions we're going to undertake in terms of establishing the framework developing and developing the roadmap for achieving universal access, um, both of which will start next year. So that is still the position. On guaranteed waiting times, we, we are committed to doing that. The implementation plan is committed to doing that, but we need Sorry, to... Sorry, could you just point to me where it is? Because I didn't see it. No, that's, and, and that's obviously... No, I, I know you're not being, yeah, no, that, no, I hope, I hope I'm right, but I, we will be legislating. Okay. Sorry, one second. No, that's not it. Sorry, just while I'm looking for that, hmm. I mean, what we what we will be, uh, no, that's not, it's not 623, no, um, we will be, um, I'll come back on the specific number in one moment, Deputy, but we, I do want to legislate uh, for wait times, like, and I've talked to the Scottish Health Minister about this last Friday as well. I want to do it, and I want to be able to show we can actually deliver them, um, and I think the elective only models is how they did it in Scotland. Um, I want to see if we can. We've given a commitment to picking three sites next year for the delivery of elective only hospitals. I want to see if we can move ahead quicker with one um, so that we can actually have a demonstrator project. And then we will then legislate for the wait times. But I need to make sure I have the capacity before legislating for the wait times. And I'll come back to you just momentarily on terms Please of the yeah. um, And did you ask me another question? Sorry. Uh, yeah, published the costings along with the, uh, the, the, yeah, the review I mean, each, and the updates. And yeah, so each year we'll obviously have to say what we're going to do in 2019 and we, um, 2019 be the next one, and we'll obviously have to show how much it's going to cost and how we're going to deliver. So, yes, in terms so of the annual will be published. Excellent. Thank you, Chair. Well, you're happy with that? Where that is, Momo. Ah, oh, next up, Chair. Happy Thank you. Now, uh, Deputy Alan Kelly, your seven minutes slot. I'll be very disciplined, Chair. Um, there be no... Uh, thank you very much, Minister. Uh, thank you very much, Laura. I don't know where to say congratulations or sorry for your troubles, but... <laughs> it's all our troubles. <laughs> Deputy. <laughs> can, I, can I just, before Deputy O'Reilly leaves, it's, it's, it's action 5.16, but I'll send it. I'm sorry, Deputy. You're okay, Minister. Um, so, uh, best of luck. Um, thank you. A number of questions. Um, I'll start off. Uh, I don't have too many, but they're, they're um, quite specific. First one is... In relation to uh, your own role, Laura, and this directly to yourself, if I was one of the, I don't know how many of us are in the room who, who wrote this launch care report. Um, the specific, in fairness to the specific uh, structures that have been put in place are what we asked to be put in place as regards advisory council, as regards where it fits within government, as regards <coughs> structures and everything like that. So two opening questions on that is one, what are you going to have as your own resources? I know you said small team earlier on. What are they? Um, and secondly is within those structures, there's no doubt that you're going to have frustrations. Dare I say some of them with the man sitting beside you from time to time, just or whoever's sitting beside you. Um, how are you going to deal with them? How are you going to ensure that you can get traction within the structures that have been put in place? When you're missing deadlines, timelines, 
aren't being put in place, resources aren't available, um, because, you know, there will be absolutely an element of that. So how are you going to use those structures or what are you going to do to ensure that you're getting what you want and when you want it? That's the first thing. Second thing, second question, that's relate, that goes to you, Laura. Second question relates to the 106 actions. And obviously then there is a whole area of the first number of years of prioritisation. For instance, one of the biggest prioritisations, which I insisted on, was in the whole area of community care and bringing that forward. Um, all the issues in relation to home help and a whole range of stuff there, which is not common sense as far as I know. The whole issue of bringing forward diagnostics because it's creating blockages all over the place. Um, so could you use that as an example in your answer as to how you see now, I know you're only there 25 days, but the pathway towards how that's going to be achieved and how you're going to interact within the structures to make that be achievable within the three year time frame. Second question. Third question, Minister, uh, hospital capacity uh, review and implementation. And thank you for your, I think, well, at least I think, thank you for your news. You more or less said that the 60 bed unit in, in Limerick is going to be part of the plan that's going to be announced. So thanks for confirming that. I appreciate it because Clamel, I get the benefit of having the two worst situations as regards uh, A and E's and and people on trolleys in, in, in either side of me, in Clamell and in Limerick, in the whole country. So thanks for confirming that. But as regards the, the, the actual capacity, um, how you, I, I presume there's going to be some process whereby the, the alignment of this work with the alignment of Slauncher Care is going to be in, in, engineered because it's critical that it is. So that's a, a definite one for yourself. Second one, Minister, you might just outline a little bit more for us and best to look with this one, and I mean that in jest. But the whole issue of G-alignment, you said you had timelines for that. What are they? Yeah. Uh, because, again, I actually agree with you that it has to be brought forward because I don't think Laura's work can actually progress until that alignment happens. And the final question to... Uh, our final two questions is when will the report from the Committee of, of Donald the Butler be available in relation to public-private? And the last one is... You've made a statement there in relation to the GP and GP contracts, I presume in relation to multiple annual funding. You know, many of us here and there say, uh, Senator Swanick will probably have questions on this later on, but like, sorry, we all know that the level of progress isn't as that. So are you saying that, that you've got this agreement now that you're going to see progress you know, moving at a different pace imminently? So there are my six questions. I think I've been succinct, Chair, hopefully. Excellent, Deputy Kelly. Thank you. It's the first. Ms. McGahey. Thank you, Deputy. Uh, Deputy. Uh, I suppose in terms of resources, I have outlined four work streams how I'm going to structure my 106 actions. This is just work in progress. Um, and they are around the citizen care master plan, so I will need population health planning expertise as part of my team, um, but also working with, out in the system with people who have that expertise. Um, in terms of coordinated governance and value for money, which is my second work stream, I need finance and governance advice into my team. Um, my third work stream is about teams of the future, and I've talked a little bit about that. Obviously, I'll need workforce planning expertise. And finally, I have a sharing progress um, work stream, which is about comms and engagement. Um, but through those, we'll have um, some service design people, some project managers, critically, uh, and then I'll need input from different people at different points in time. So uh, we've got economic uh, background or whichever piece they need at the time. So between now and the end of the year, I'm working out how the action plan is going to be structured, what my team is going to be in-house, but I'm going to keep it tight because there is expertise out in the system and I'm proposing that the office is a kind of a bridge out to the system and that we just to make sure everything is coordinated and happening in the right sequence so I hope that answers your question uh, yeah and just the second part of the question what happens when you don't get what you want what are you going to do um, well I can't anticipate that because I'm sure I will get what I want mm -hmm. <laughs> well, but if I don't being, being serious you can't do something unless you know you have the right resources in behind it so I won't be promising that I can deliver something unless I have the right resources and I won't know I have the right resources for the next number of months and to be fair until I've worked out what the priorities are 
which will be at the end of the year, which I've committed to doing, which I will do, it's hard to predict exactly what they will require. But I think the things that you outlined there um, in terms of uh, bringing the community care um, closer and making sure that that works properly is definitely, and the things that you outlined at the home health, etc., the diagnostics, they're absolutely priorities. If the whole system is going to work, that has to be first focus. Thank okay. you. Um, thank you, Laura. Um, thanks, Deputy Kelly. Um, so, yeah, University Hospital Limerick has one of the um, most acute situations in terms of a lack of bed capacity. You've highlighted this here many times before. Um, they're working very hard uh, at a hospital level to develop a not just to develop a modular proposal, but to deliver on it. Uh, would I, my understanding is that they uh, sought planning permission, and my understanding is that there may be a, a further appeal there, but I'm not subject to that information. But I, I just read that somewhere. Um, but but subject to that being rectified, I want to see this progress, and I want to see it progress urgently. I think Timelines? It depends on the completion of the planning process. But, but just say that's but, done in a few months. But we, we'll be ready to go as soon as they're ready to go. OK. Um, in terms of progressing it. I, and I want to thank the hospital group CEO, but she put a lot of work into it and didn't uh, plough down with it as well, which I think was very important um, in terms of being ready. Um, the And obviously in Clonmel, as you know, the 40-bed modular um, is also progressing. And my understanding is it's due to open very early in the new year, but I'll confirm that with you. But it's it's progressing well, is my understanding, and I hope to be in a position to, to visit yep. it uh, shortly. On the geo-alignment, um, what you've said is 100% correct. I mean, we can't. We, if if the idea of Sancha Care is to reduce bureaucracy, increase accountability, and move more services locally where appropriate to do so, we need to have regional entities with joined up thinking and a continuum of care for the patient. So until we until we kind of address that, grasp that nettle, um, that we we can't move forward much much further. So that's why we've taken a decision, and there's a number of actions. Um, the first strategic action. Uh, we've, we've said that we will consult and finalise decisions on the geographic alignment of hospital groups and community health organisations by the end of this year. So I will announce by the end of this year what I expect, um, or what I would like, be a matter ultimately for the Oireachtas to legislate, but what I would like to be the regional uh, entities. We will then in 2019, this is another specific action, we'll introduce modifications to the hospital groups and community health organisations to ensure a geographic alignment and we'll begin to develop processes for integrated performance management on an interim administrative basis, so let them let them bed in and test. We'll start in 2019 to devolve decision making, we've done this already with the hospital groups, so we'll devolve decision making and autonomy, um, sorry, autonomy rather, uh, in line with their functionality. And then the action plan says in 2021 we legislate for these revised structures. But if I'm to be very honest, if there was a willingness in your office to legislate a little bit earlier than that, I'd be very open to doing that as well. I'd like to do that quickly. The other action, just on the on the alignment piece, Chair, and it's an action for next year, and it's a really important one, is as well as doing this, it's also to define the new organisational operation structure in terms of what will the what will the new slimmed down HSE do over time, and what will the Department of Health do over time. So. A Department of Health in the context of Sancha Care, a HSE in the context of new regional entities and the regional entities. So there's uh, one, two, three, five specific actions there on, on geo alignment, all taking place kind of by the end of this year uh, or next year. Doc, uh, Dr. De Butler, Dr. Donald De Butler's group, uh, his original timeline is he's due to have his work um, publicly, he's stated he'll have his work completed by the end of this year. Um, so I'd hope to receive that report by the end of this year or very early at the start of next year. It's going to be a, it's going to be a very important piece of work. Um, as you know, there's many vested interests arguing as to why we shouldn't do this. Um, there's many people that you and I represent uh, that I think need us to get this right. Um, but we do need to get it right on a phased basis and in an appropriate way. Um, and I'll be, I'll be very much influenced uh, by the work of that expert group, which contains a lot of really good, um, a lot of really good expertise. And the GP contract, put bluntly, yes. Um, I expect now to be in a position to see progress. If there's a willingness. Um, on both sides, which I think there is in fairness, I really think there is, but you know, it takes two sides to negotiate. Um, I have a mandate now um, from public expenditure reform and my own department in terms of both policy objectives being aligned with the funding stream. Okay. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank you very much, Minister. Now we are going to invite uh, Deputy uh, O'Mahony. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, first of all, I would um, like to uh, thank you both for coming in here this morning and to especially welcome you, Laura, and congratulate you um, and to wish you well. It's thank not you, going you. to be an easy an easy task. And if there's anything I can do personally, thank you. Um, I'm, my door will always be open, open to you. Uh, I'd like to uh, say well done, I suppose, at the start to everybody who is involved in, in Sloan to Care. 
I know an awful lot of hard work went into it and I think it is fantastic that health is now above politics and that it will, through this plan, remain that way and that we will be all on the same hymn sheet. And I think maybe other departments should take notice of this and 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 act accordingly. Uh, just a few questions, Minister, and apologies if other people have asked them, I to step out to meet um, some farmers that were up from West Cork. It's very important. So, um, Minister, you were saying there uh, it'll move our system to a population-based approach. Uh, you might just go into that a bit further, please. Um, you said uh, new models of care will be designed that are structured, coherent and tailored to population need. When do you envisage this happening? And could that not have been done already or started already anyway? Um, you were then saying Salonta care implementation will require a stronger system of community care. Is this system decided on already? And then...